Well, uh, good morning, everybody. That show of hands was the most galvanizing thing. <laughs> um, the hell of filmmaking, um, four or five years of it, uh, to then come and meet audiences who say it um, is, uh, is really wonderful. So um, it's a lovely start. Uh, I'm going to begin by saying just a, a few uh, words about the film Four Horsemen. Um, and then go on to talk about why, having made it and gone through that process, uh, I don't ever feel that we will return to business as usual. Um, so just very quickly, a little bit of history on the film. It premiered this time last year, exactly this time last year. In fact, this weekend last year at IDFA, which is the kind of can for documentaries, if you like, in the Netherlands. Um, it was seen there by a lot of people who program festivals. It did quite well at that festival, and they then picked it up and played it uh, at their festivals around the world. To date, it's done about 26 festivals, I think. Um, it has um, really chimed with a lot of audiences in places where economically it's been very tough. So, for instance, Ireland, uh, it won an audience prize, and you can almost uh, imagine why. Um, people who've been on the receiving end of bad economic policy mm -hmm. tend to embrace the message uh, a lot quicker. Chile, also, it did very well. So um, we made the film because four years ago we realised, four and a half years ago, five years ago, we realised there was something really badly wrong with the global economy. And no one was talking about it. Uh, so we went and tried to raise some money and we said to people, look, this is pre-2008. We said, look, there's something really badly wrong with the global economy. No one's talking about it. And they said, don't worry, everything will be fine. And then 2008 happened, and we were still trying to raise money. And um, we, we went and said, look, we said, you know, and, and this, is going to be, this is going to be ongoing. And they said, no, don't worry, they've put it all back together. Just carry on and sleep. <laughs> and um, we carried on making the film. The other thing that was said, that, uh, which was curious, was that we won't ever get young people, or in fact anyone else, interested in economics. And one of the fa uh, fascinating things I've found on the circuit, taking this film around, is that 65, 70% of audiences are 35 and younger. Um, for the first time ever, people are realizing that the current generation coming through may not live as well as the generations that have gone before. And through necessity, they're having to re-engage. And I see this as hugely hopeful. So. Um, Having done hundreds of Q&As, I'm going to be honest with you, this is daunting, because uh, you're all economists and philosophers. <laughs> so the Q&A is probably going to be quite sparkly. But that's uh, where the kind of learning uh, goes on, where those clash of ideas come out, uh, and that kind of learning moves us all forward. Um, what I'm going to do is present it, because we are a filmmaking uh, business, I'm going to present the speech as a scriptwriter would present a Hollywood movie that using the Hollywood formula, um, because, um, well, uh, the reason is we can then give ourselves a bit more context. It's really difficult when you're in a situation, when you're in a system, to get far enough away from the system to understand the system. Now, you're either consciously aware or unaware of this, um, and I'm going to add a couple of things to it, um, but this generally is what happens. In fact, it happened to all of you this morning getting here. We always go through this, however tough or however easy your journey's way, we will have all gone through this. If you're making a cup of tea, there's an exciting event, I want a cup of tea. Uh, you then call to action. If it's in our office, you've then got to get through a lot of dirty washing up that no one else has done. Um, exhalating complexity, there's no milk. Uh, obviously, there's a penny drop moment, I need milk. Uh, bad guys close in, shops closed over the road in some massive conspiratorial uh, <laughs> venture against you. And then the protagonist has a final battle. You go to another shop, whatever it may be, and you hit your new equilibrium, which is you have your cup of tea. So that's how I think best to package this. Um, so disclaimer and spoiler alert, there will be some blood, uh, gore, and bad guys, um, but ultimately there'll be a penny drop moment and finally new equilibrium. Whether or not there's a happy ending is up to you. Um, but uh, that's the format. For the first time in history, uh, four megatrends are converging. This hasn't happened before. These four megatrends are a rapacious financial system, escalating organized violence, depletion of the Earth's natural resources, and abject poverty or famine for the bottom billions. These trends are converging at a time when politicians, economists, and organized religion have stalled. Equally, 
they've arrived at a time when conditions for change have never been more favourable. Globally, we are collected, connected to one another like never before. But that's often wheeled out, that uh, example. Something else is at play that I think a lot of people underestimate. And that is that we have one of the biggest people opportunities in history. And when I say people opportunities, I mean that globally hundreds of thousands of people are unemployed or leaving university without a job to go to. As, a nece as necessity is the greatest motivator, those people will be forced into creating their own employment or organisations. There is understandable fear associated with taking full responsibility for your employment. But I really see the make a job paradigm versus take a job as full of potential. Whether you see it as fearful or exciting really depends on your perspective. During Making Four Horsemen, we tended to bump into two types of people. One would reaffirm to us constantly how terrible it all is and how we were all doomed. Uh, and the other was somebody who sees the massive opportunities that are associated with the creative destruction that we're witnessing at the moment. Out of the cynic and the optimist, I prefer to listen to the latter. The former, often, consciously or not, wants the situation to return to how it was. And nothing would terrify me more than returning to business as we've seen it. It is odd, or plain mad, to hear politicians and business leaders talking about getting back to business as usual. Are they inferring that a massive credit expansion and subsequent unsustainable asset bubble is actually an optimum market condition? Is that what they're saying? And more importantly, is that what we want? Even if man on the street cannot fully articulate it, almost everyone I've spoken to while screening the film knows intuitively that there's something profoundly wrong with how we currently order our economies and therefore societies. Everyone has a sense that the future is going to change, but understandably, where there's change, there's trepidation. So, understanding what went wrong, inciting event. 2008, it's quite nebulous when we say that. It's an amorphous thing. There's a global financial crisis. What was it? What happened? What happened, really, when understanding what happened, really depends on who you ask. Uh, if you ask a banker, he or she, often he, will tell you that it was a government problem. They didn't regulate us enough. What they won't say is that their lobbyists have badgered government for years to allow the free-for-all, but there you go. If you ask a government, they'll point to another government and say, well, it's Greece what started it. That's the kind of general default position. It's tribal. Point to someone else. Try and get rid of the blame. If you ask a man on the street, he'll say it was bankers and the government colluding against the people. Not bad, but again, a little conspiratorial. If you ask a monetary reformist, uh, they may say it was errant central bankers' policy of creating cheap money and then giving it to their chums. Again, not bad. Finally, if you ask the neoclassical economist, he'll say to you, what crisis? Because <laughs> it wasn't in our models. We have no way of telling that it is a crisis. It does not exist. If we agree that it's futile to blame others, then we have to accept that the mere culpa is collective. If, in one way or another, everyone was complicit, then collectively we've got to do some introspection. From a personal point of view, alarm bells rang seven years ago when we were offered a colossal amount of credit to buy a shoebox-sized flat in North London without anyone checking our repayment ability. We didn't know whether to open a bottle of champagne and celebrate or open it and commiserate uh, with what inevitably was going to unfold. From a filmmaker's point of view, the most important thing became context. I had to put an overarching narrative uh, that looked at root causes and historical patterns um, because what I wasn't interested in is chasing bankers around. What we needed and still need is systemic literacy. What we don't need is distraction. At that point, what became really interesting is what wasn't being reported in the mainstream media. Like Gutenberg's printing press, the internet gave me and the team access to the world's best thinkers who had understandably been marginalised. So really the question became, 
Where do you look for answers? Did we want truth or did we want tabloid sensation? Did we want scapegoats to vent our short-term cynical anger or do we want to genuinely understand systemic problems? If it is triage, then what we should do now is move the crisis to the psychological realm. We should say films like Four Horsemen talked the economy down and therefore there was a crisis of, uh, of consumer confidence and the whole thing fell apart. It's an odd uh, way of describing it. Um, and frankly, if only we had that power. If you want uh, to understand the economic structure we preside over and the levers that actively drove us into this mess, then in my view, uh, there are three areas that we should focus on. And unfortunately, these three areas aren't getting the kind of focus they need at the moment because they're not being debated in the mainstream media. Some might say that's because the media is owned predominantly by the financial, insurance and real estate businesses, the fire sector but I'll let you judge that. So, what are the levers? What are the drivers? I'd like to suggest that those, the three that I mentioned that are worth contemplating are rent seeking, credit creation, and engineered complacency. So, uh, what is rent seeking? Well, we have, uh, in general, stopped creating wealth, uh, and that's a bit of a problem. What we now do, as a society, is appropriate the wealth created by other people. And this is rent-seeking. Profit-seeking describes the process of investing capital in return for a share of the new wealth created. Rent-seeking, however, is about skimming off a share of wealth created by others. And that is the key point. Rent-seeking is about skimming off a share of wealth created by others for oneself. Today, uh, colonialism is distasteful, but strangely, we accommodate the imperialist levers that encourage it. But instead of now going to far-flung places around the world to extract wealth from native people, as happened during the uh, empire-building years of imperialist countries, today, rent-seekers have created a system closer to home, or in fact, at home, uh, that has legalized and actually glorified the rent-seeking process. Rent-seeking can take many forms. The pre-crash craze for private equity takeovers of perfectly viable business is a form of rent-seeking. The income earned by rent-seekers often comes from land rent. Russian oligarchs, for example, owe their immense wealth to the fact that they were effectively given free use of vast quantities of natural resources after the fall of communism. Rent-seeking has always cost in terms of resources, that could otherwise be applied to the creation of new wealth. Not only is it a legalized form of economic theft, but it also diverts resources from the real economy. The only people able to successfully engage in rent-seeking activities are often the people who are already so well off that they don't need to find work in the real economy. So, it's no wonder that they get aggrieved when their monopoly is threatened. Take Stephen Sharma, for instance. He's the CEO of Blackstone. Blackstone is the American company specializing in private equity, real estate, and credit. It was this company who siphoned off the economic rent from Southern Cross nursing homes in the UK. Schwarzman bought Southern Cross in 2004 for £162 million and flipped it three years later for well over four times the original price. If it goes bust, the British taxpayer will have to pay £600 million a year to rehouse the 31,000 patients, elderly, or, as they're seen by rent seekers, the rent-paying economic units. In August 2010, when US President Barack Obama said he was going to raise carried interest rates, or better, not treat carried interest as income, which would close the tax loophole to curb this kind of practice, Schwarzman compared the president's plan to Hitler's invasion of Poland in 1939. Incidentally, lobbying politicians to enact legislation that will make it harder for producers to gain entry to a market or protect your monopoly is another form of rent-seeking. So we live in a society where rent-seeking is rife, I would suggest, and those who embark on it, strangely, are celebrated. But what about credit creation? Credit creation is another lever that has got us to here. 
And it's this lever that drives the business cycle, the housing cycle, and monetary policy. During a massive boom, or to give it another definition, credit expansion, people tend to lose their heads. It's Rudyard Kipling's lesser-known poem, if you can keep your head during a real estate boom, you're a better man than me, Gunga Din. <laughs> this creation of new debt increases the money supply and temporarily stimulates economic activity. This temporarily raises economic growth and employment, but the emphasis should be on the word temporarily. When I say credit creation, what I actually mean is private banks' ability and willingness to create money out of thin air and lend it at interest. It is this point that we mustn't lose sight of. This concept is so distasteful, it simply isn't accepted. People say, but hang on, when I pay money into the bank, that money is then used to pay other people, is it not? Uh, no, and if only it was. When you go and apply for a mortgage, the money you apply for doesn't actually exist. It comes into existence only when you sign the contract, then someone somewhere hits a computer keyboard, and like magic, that amount of capital appears on the private bank balance sheet as their asset and your liability. For a time globally, this created a dazzling economic miracle. House prices took off and consumer spending went berserk, as we all dutifully indulged in the escapism of consumerism. Conventional wisdom and common sense were parked, as almost everyone took their eye off the ball and partied hard. Question is, miracle or mirage? The mechanism was simple. The more credit that was produced from thin air was absorbed into the sponge-like land market. And suddenly, land speculation became one of the most profitable games in town. TV property pundits around the world convinced everybody that the tulip mania not just of British housing, but all housing, was the road to universal riches. Why go out and work and add real value when you can buy a flat, paint the walls magnolia, lay generic wooden floors, install an obligatory water feature, and then flip the debt-laden asset to someone else and hope that the music keeps playing? Temporarily, it worked. Homeowners got a huge uplift in their property prices, bankers received massive bonuses, and IKEA's sc sales skyrocketed. But as a side effect, what did everyone else get? That's a question that wasn't being asked. I'd like to say that what everyone else got was a consumption-based economy. We have to ask the question, have high, ho high house prices been a positive long-term effect on the economies of the US? on the economy of Japan, on the economy of Ireland, on the economy of Spain, on the economy of Portugal. The list goes on. Remember in 1989, the Japanese proudly estimated that the land occupied by the Imperial Palace was worth more than all the real estate in California combined. So is there a link between those temporary economic bragging rights and the fact today that current Japanese debts are equal to 240% of the country's GDP. If there is a link, why is it that over the last 50 years or so, we've labored under the idea that an inflated housing market is a positive indicator for a healthy economy? What has clouded the vision? What has clouded our vision? Is it the case that perhaps the polar opposite is true, that low, steady house prices and a mobile workforce is a better national scenario? Is it the case that when rent seekers start to look to extract land rent, along with credit creation, we all logically end up with a consumption-based economy? And that is an important question. A consumption-based economy has certainly been the physical manifestation, but for that to happen subtly, something else must have happened to usher in the new paradigm. During the boom, and this is the complacency aspect I'd like to put to you. During the boom, many people assumed a here-to-be-served mentality. Instead of being active stewards of the society in which we lived, many people actually attached their house price to our self-worth. We defined ourselves not by what we produced or what we worked towards, but by what we consumed. Unfortunately today, we're still living with this service mentality because someone else in London, Washington, or Brussels are looking after our affairs 
on our behalf, aren't they? Uh, no, they're not. <laughs> they are paddling for their own economic and political lives, and the last people they're thinking about are you. In fact, they probably think it was you who caused all this, <laughs> and in a blizzard of escalating complexity, uh, we could be led to believe that it is our fault. No one can be blamed for relying on increased house prices because their basic consumption has been outstripped and their wages have been suppressed. Nobody can be blamed for borrowing money to feed clothe their children. Um, so what we don't need now is a heavy dose of self-flagellation. What we need to do is take the goggles off. At the point where we'd interviewed, I think it was around 20 people for um, Four Horsemen, um, I began to kind of make sense of what were seemingly random uh, events. And, and, and the arc started to come together. And then there was a moment when we were editing the film, because everyone that we uh, met, the story would change. So you, we got 23 people in the th film, as, um, plus uh, Kevin Garrett, Graham, and, and the guys who've been foreclosed in Baltimore. Um, and when we brought that material back, it, was all, it would always change the overarching narrative. But there was a moment when we were, I was sitting with Simon Moderate, the editor of the film, and that was the kind of goggles off moment. That was the moment the penny dropped. And the conclusion was this the system hasn't failed. The whole mainstream media said the system's failed. The system's failed. And it hasn't. Although plundered of late, the hardware of the planet has not changed dramatically over millennia, but the software, i.e. the economics that we use to interact with the Earth's hardware has not been upgraded. And it's those economics that have structurally determined our fate. So here's the key point. Those economics, that software, have worked perfectly according to the code or the rules that they operate on. And though counterintuitive, the economics that we uphold today have delivered exactly the world that we've asked them to. And this is simultaneously hopeful and tragic. Tragic because of the scale of the lost human potential and the massive suffering they've caused. Huge amounts of environmental degradation. But hopeful because there's a solution. All right, I said there'll be some blood and gore. Um, and we have to start, unfortunately, in the negative. But um, don't worry. What have been the effects of this heady mix of rent-seeking, credit creation, engineered or not complacency, and then compromised economics? Well, at the beginning of the 21st century, private banks created money out of thin air, which pumped up land values, which created an unsustainable asset bubble in societies that operate a skewed economic and monetary system. This has pushed housing, a basic human right, out of the reach of millions and left the intergenerational contract in tatters. At the expense of our environment, the globalised growth economy has demanded that we make infinite consumption a way of life. Socially, he who dies with the most toys has become a lauded goal, and retail therapy has replaced spiritual satisfaction. As the West awakens from this consumerist stupor, we are starting to realise that the human has been replaced by the consumer, cheap money has anaesthetised the electorate, and allowed rapacious financial institutions to further shape economic policy with only one thing in mind, greater profit. The outcome is that Western civilization has become accustomed to disrespect and neurosis, while status competition, internet addiction, overeating, binge drinking, and substance abuse have become commonplace. The irony, all this has been promoted in the pursuit of happiness. So, a better question than why won't we get back to business as usual is why would we want to get back to business as usual? Let's put this in a different context. If we look at this uh, in a Stone Age context, think of it. A caveman has just discovered how to use fire and um, he's so excited he goes back and introduces it to his tribe. So he goes to the elder and he shows the benefits of tamed fire and he shows the elder and the tribe that, look, you can cook food with it, you can light, and you've got a new weapon. Suddenly, the fire maker has become one of the most important people in the tribe, right? He's a resourceful chap, and he's the new guy on the block. But the tribe elder can see the power structure was going to shift, the hierarchy is going to change. 
So to maintain control, the tribal elder will probably point out the negative aspects of fire. He'll use propaganda to maintain his position. He'll say something like, um, you know, this fire thing is going to upset the gods. This fire thing, so, you know, better, better put that away. We've got to get back to business as usual. Really, what's happening with the tribe elder is he's understanding, consciously or not, that there are two options. The first is to go back to that business as usual, the darkness, the, the polluted food, and all the rest of it. No fire. Um, and none of the progression that is associated with the fire. So what he's wanting is status quo. The second option is to embrace change, improve the quality of life significantly, and thrive. The stifling first option would mean that the quality of life within the tribe would diminish and their competitiveness within the wider world would be compromised. Think of another tribe with a different elder, a good delegator who's confident and serves his people. He's open to the new knowledge and embraces the fire. It's harnessed and his tribe thrives. Today, in my view, humanity is at that junction. We're being presented with the modern day equivalent of fire, i.e. the knowledge and the ability to hinge, including the favorable conditions, the track that we are on. But we're lumbered with a global society riven by competing short-term interests who want to maintain the status quo. Our tribal elders are, expl our tri are our tribal elders exploiting value creators and stunting the growth and development of their people in an attempt to remain relevant? This is quite an interesting question. If that is the case, how do we begin to renegotiate a desperately needed new social contract? How do you unleash genuine wealth creators? How do you achieve social justice, domestic tranquility, and liberty? And, as importantly, how do you get the rest of the tribe to step out of their comfort zone and see the potential of new ideas and embrace the change? From a filmmaker's perspective, having found an overarching narrative and spoken to people who only looked very narrowly at their uh, bit of the economy or their, their bit of academic study, um, the first thing that strikes me is that we have to now get out of our silos and look at the economy, look at our world in a more holistic way. To do that, we do a lot worse than look to nature. Without being trite, we have to be a little more like bees. Now, bees in a hive operate uh, a single organism with every cell contributing, foraging, and acting solely for the good of the whole. If we were to think about the planet as a commonly owned organism, and not just focus on our individual seemingly disconnected cells, then a good place to start reform would be to look at the following three areas. The first is overarching, and it's our current economic arrangements. The second is the crisis of leadership and how we structure our businesses. And the third, that's our economics. Uh, the way we interact with the earth, its natural resources, and each other. First, let's take the current economic setup. For me, three things have been highlighted over the course of making Four Horsemen, which lie at the heart of our current economic dysfunction. And they should, at the very least, be acknowledged as a barrier to progress. First is unearned income and wealth derived from land rent. The second is creation of money by privately owned banks. And the third, speculation in currencies, commodities, and derivatives. The enjoyment of unearned wealth, the product of rent-seeking activities, takes real value from those who actually create it. It also takes community-created value. It restricts opportunities for new wealth creation, and it excludes millions from the economy. This must be recognized. A stable money supply is the cornerstone to a decent economy and democracy. A money supply that is in the hands of private banks is, as we've witnessed, disastrous. They're incentivized to create new money, more debt, because that's where the profit center lies. Steps must be taken to stabilize the money supply and ensure that it's a public function serving the people who use it. Thankfully, 
people are starting to wake up to this. Speculation in commodity markets, including those for food and other essentials. This disrupts the pricing mechanism and it leads the core poor people, the bottom billions, to being priced out of food markets. The establishment of speculative derivative markets and the practice of what's called trading on margin, whereby money is created purely for speculation, in my view, have absolutely no place in a civilised society. Only by reformation of the financial system, the monetary system and the tax system can we address these issues. But that reform is not going to come from the top down. That brings us to the second point, which is leadership. Leadership and how we order our businesses. At one quick glance, in any newspaper on any day, shows you we're not living actually in the golden age of leadership. There are good examples, no doubt. But generally, businesses, organisations and governments are struggling. We see it in the news reports. Although a hierarchy is, an, is effective for some tasks, in a networked world, a hierarchy is seen as a Victorian relic. Command and control was effective, but today a steep hierarchy is perceived as a response to a low-trust environment. Agile, effective leaders intuitively understand this, and they understand that to lead well you must be a great delegator and attentive follower. The guys and girls that you want leading are the creative thinkers with a deep sense of purpose. They often think of leadership as service, and it's these leaders who can create the environment for progressive business and consequently the conditions for genuine innovation. By substituting control freaks with nimble delegators, an organisation begins to thrive and generate wealth. It always makes my heart sink when I read interviews in broadsheet newspapers and you see a business leader who cites that his favourite book is Machiavelli's The Prince or The Art of War. These are the cynics. Recently, a former investment banker sitting on the Independent Commission on Banking called into question the Bank of England's centralised and hierarchical system. He said that the Bank of England staff had, quote, a tendency to filter recommendations in such a way as to maximise the likelihood that senior staff will find the recommendation palatable. Whilst this might make it easier for Sir Mervyn King to reach conclusions, decision-making cultivated in this way is naturally limited. In my experience, it's always the seemingly wild idea that's full of potential. As a leader, the job is to nurture and protect that idea until people can buy into it and it can stand on its own. Yes, leadership is lonely, but employing yes men in a hierarchy for convenience or internal self-preservation has a devastating effect on the organisation and its effectiveness on wider society. Here's Sir Mervyn, the tribal elder who shuns the discovery of fire in favour of the status quo. I'll leave you to answer that too. But it's a question that's worth turning over. So who is getting it right? Well, there are plenty of people getting it right, thankfully. And if we're going to take a nation, Iceland. Iceland's one of many examples. It was first into the crisis, uh, and it'll probably be the first out of it. And women have had a huge role to play in that. Two women who were fed up with the testosterone-charged banking world were Halla Tomistrador and Kristen Peristadinador. I'm sorry about the pronunciation, but frankly, <laughs> if you're going to name a volcano in your way you did, Iceland, you deserve it. <laughs> um, Halla and Kristen, as they'll now be referred to, um, they set up Ardor Capital during the crash and didn't lose a penny of their clients' money. Um, so how do they do that? Well, Haller says, and I quote her, it goes back to our Viking women. While the men were out there raping and pillaging, the women were at home running the show. So let you meditate on that for a second. <laughs> Don't discuss that tonight over a couple of glasses of wine at dinner. <laughs> She says um, their business has five core feminine values. 
First, risk awareness. They will not invest in things they do not understand. Second, profit with principles. Uh, they like a wider definition of profit. So it's not just economic, but it has to have a positive social, personal, and environmental impact. The third is emotional capital, key point. When they invest, they do an emotional due diligence test on the organization they're going to invest in. And they assess whether the corporate culture, the business culture in that organization, is an asset or a liability. Fourth, straight talking. They think the language of finance should be accessible and not part of the alienating nature of current banking culture. And lastly, independence. Fifth, they uh, would like to see more women increasingly financially independent so they can become the person that they can be. So they're the values they've built their business on, and it's successful. But it can't be, right? It can't be. We can't use those values. That's not how the world works. It's naive. It's stupid. Those values, it's just fantasy, right? Because the intense market competition out there means that feminine naivety is it's going to cost them dear, especially in a dog-eat-dog -dog world, right? But think of it. When was the last time you saw a dog eat a dog? <laughs> the male ego loves this language and posturing, but the brutal concept is a myth. Dogs don't eat dogs. Dogs help dogs. Like us, dogs are pack animals predisposed to help one another most of the time. Admittedly, there are mad dogs, but when, we, when dog packs spot them, they ostracize them. And that's where we humans differ from our faithful friends. Bizarrely, we humans tend to celebrate mad dogs. Seriously, if you will for a minute, just imagine a world populated entirely by Gordon Gecko. Imagine Donald Trump, billions of them. Or, of course, Mitt Romney. The latter strapped his dog to the roof of his car and went on a 12-hour road trip with it. <laughs> Crazy. Imagine this world if those people were the dominating faction. Imagine what humanity would look like. So my suggestion would be let's park this unexamined dog-eat-dog -dog assumption. It's just plain wrong. It is the, and I'd ask this question on the back of that. Is it the case that the tendency in most people to cooperate is stronger and more widespread than the tendency to compete and destroy? If so, in short, we need to get over ourselves. We need to be courageous enough to stop raping and pillaging, and we need to be cooperative. I know, terrifying stuff. Oddly, beginning the shift from competition to cooperation will not be easy, but we have to remain optimistic. Globally, today, more people work for cooperatives than they do multinationals. 75% of all fair trade produce is grown by co-ops. The movement is the ultimate sleeping giant and a lifeline for workers. Cooperatives create local jobs that generate real wealth for the community. By anchoring public service procurement or local food production, they begin to stabilise and revitalise areas that have been looted by big business. By anchoring jobs and local money, they stop capital flight. This is not a point that the proponents of globalisation can make. Cooperatives tend to originate where latent demand and skills are present but untapped. When these skills are unlocked, the transformational effect on the community and the individual is significant. Leadership and development qualities naturally unfold, rendering many of the one-size-fits-all government think tank initiatives obsolete. The personal growth of owners is something that occurs when they're given responsibility for their own future. This autonomy begins to change the entitlement and consumer cultures. It also means that people start to communicate with each other. Interestingly, the percentage of former criminals working in co-ops, and I say criminals in inverted commas, in the US is significant. Ordinarily, these people would have been locked out of the job market for a menial crime in their late teens. Logically, they have to then trade in the black market for life, which puts in tremendous pressure on the courts in America and the police. However, it gives tremendous profits to the privatized American prison system. The cooperative structure gives meaning and purpose. 
It begins to address the root causes of the understandable live-for-the-weekend culture that's a direct consequence of Western employment models and suppressed wages. This co-op model is not new. It's just been forgotten. We have been complacent when we're looking at models. By removing job insecurity and supporting the individual, family and, uh, family and wealth building begin to occur. This starts a virtuous circle that's diametrically opposed to the race to the bottom economy that we currently tolerate. This positive democratic ownership lever at the heart of co-ops give employees a stake in their future. Hope begins to return and they're motivated to pay closer attention to the decisions that will affect their lives. In short, the cooperative a cooperative is the perfect ant antidote to predatory capitalism. If the rentier is the enemy of the entrepreneur and the worker class needs to be protected from people like Schwarzman, Gecko, Trump, Romney et al., then the co-op is the model to do it. No, it's not perfect, but it can be modified so those spoils do not get away. If Goethe reminds us that man can survive anything but a succession of ordinary days, then cooperatives remind us that it is possible for people to have dignified jobs in democratic workplaces. So, as we conclude, I'd like to say that the last point is the very ideology and the ideas that have, let's say, locked us and locked these levers into uh, structurally determined behaviour that has driven us to where we've got to today. And that, ladies and gentlemen, uh, are our economics. Uh, the prevailing ideology that has got us here is the neoclassical economic paradigm, or orthodox economics, the type of economics that are being taught in uh, universities all over the world. And strangely, we continue to teach and uphold this lunacy, even though it's brought us to the brink of financial and ecological ruin. The growth-obsessed paradigm continually sells off our natural capital and calls it income. It's structurally geared to make us consume infinitely on a finite planet. It does not recognise land as a unique factor of production. Its supporters do not factor banks, money or debt into their models when they're producing forecasts. And then they wonder why they can't, predicting, can't, can't predict what's actually happening in the real economy. It's an ideology that gives undergraduate economic students a degree but barely lets them see a real-world example of how economics actually works. All the examples in their textbooks are based not on reality but on a hypothetical idea that is crafted carefully to make the results fit the theory. May I suggest to you that not even the most cynical Stone Age elder would do this. The same students are forced to use micro-concepts to describe the macro-economy, and they leave university thinking that there's nothing wrong with utilitarianism and a reductionist approach to ethics. They're told that as economists, they shouldn't do morality, but they're unable to see that not doing morality makes the biggest judgment call on morality ever, i.e. amoralism is fine. It's acceptable. This is a philosophically absurd situation. Don't worry, all is not lost. Uh, last November, 70 Harvard economics students walked out of their lecture by faculty head uh, Greg Mankiw. Uh, they are angry at the conservative nature of Harvard's economics course and suspicious at their lecturer's failure to predict the ongoing crisis and have begun to lose faith in the theories and the neoclassical ideology. Earlier this year, we screened four horsemen at the Oxford Union and after the debate, the head of economics there came to me and he said, thanks for making this. It means that I can now say that what we've been teaching for the last X years is practically useless. <laughs> he is a brave man, ladies and gentlemen, because many in his position would never utter those dangerous words. But thankfully, the cat is out of the bag. As we all upgrade our computer software every 18 months or mobile phones, it's now time, I would suggest to you, that we have to upgrade the Earth's operating system with dynamic people and planet-centric code. That has to happen. And if you want to avert the all-is-lost moment, if we're focusing anywhere else, then frankly we're 
potentially wasting our time. That is a working surface that we should give some attention to. Enacting this change, along with taking a more holistic view, would bring us naturally to new equilibrium. In storytelling terms, new equilibrium is the point where the protagonist has reached his or her quest, having won the final battle. They win the final battle by fundamentally changing the rules. That's what protagonists do. By changing those rules, the, but the protagonist changes the world, but importantly, they change themselves. That's the shift we see in people in the narrative arc. At that point, the members of the audience perceive the old world as so unpalatable, so regressive, so laughable, that they never want to go back there. In short, at the new equilibrium, the world can never go back to how it was because we've reached new knowledge and understanding. At this point, the motives of certain mad dog characters in the story are exposed, and they're then faced down as we enter a new phase called Brave New World. To make this shift, we have to understand that leadership is a process, not a position. Hopefully today, we can see the distinction, make the distinction between leaders and ongoing leadership. Hopefully today, we can now make the distinction between the theory of economics, as it's taught, and the reality. Hopefully we make the distinction between value creators and those who extract value, between cynics and optimists, and between those who ask the genuine question, who really want to push us forward, and those who waylay humanity by playing devil's advocate. Hopefully we agree that we don't need any more heroic acts or fiery political platitudes just first steps in the right direction. For this, what we do need is the thing that enables every society to take those changes in its stride. What's that? Well, it's people. Can't be done any other way. People whose education is rounded, not just academic. People whose judgment is calm and perceptive. People whose actions are aligned with good intent. People who, when needed, are prepared to step up as leaders, even if they are not the leader in terms of position. The here-to-be-served mentality has not worked. Maybe the here-to-serve mentality is more effective. This empowering approach places the initiative with groups of individuals who can collectively set a direction and build commitment and momentum towards any shared goal. During an age where we're distracted by the illusion of choice, really, I break it to you, we have only two choices, action or reaction. Reaction means countless ad hoc responses to short-term pressures and ultimately a loss of control. Action, conscious action, means assuming stewardship of the world you, we, inhabit. For this audience, I would like to echo the wise words of Tony Judd and suggest that a philosopher's job is not just to interpret the world, but to change it for the better. With this in mind, we're left with a beautifully simple question. Do we act or do we react? I would suggest to you that how we, you, personally answer that question will become our new business as usual. Thank you very much.